Hello everyone, welcome back. So today's dilemma is to print more money or to not print more money, okay? So that is the dilemma that the United States faces, okay? So uh, let's look at the current situation. The total US dollar debt around the world is $75 trillion, okay? So that's the US dollar world debt, okay? Of that, 35 trillion belongs to the United States, okay? The United States government, okay? So that's our national debt, $35 trillion, okay? So the total US cash around the world is $25 trillion, okay? So the obvious problem here is that there's only $25 trillion in, in US dollars available to pay the total $75 trillion of world debt, okay? So the question becomes like, how is this possible, right? How can you, how can you have more debt than you have money available, okay? Um, so this system was designed to work like this, okay? So this is the reason why uh, money has value because there's never enough money available to pay for all the debt, okay? So everybody's, you know, everybody's like perpetually chasing that carrot on the stick. So I've covered this on a prior video. I'm gonna real quickly, I'll try to go through it so everybody understands how money is created. When you take a mortgage on a house, okay, your local bank creates the money. They take the deed to the house. They take the, they take ownership of the house and they use that to create money. And they only create the principal amount. They don't create the interest. So if you if you get a mortgage for two hundred thousand dollars, you have to pay back three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so this happens to everybody across the board. Okay, so uh, let's say this year in my generation. Everybody that gets a mortgage for $200,000 has to pay back $300,000. Obviously, there's not enough money for us to pay back our principal plus the interest. How are we going to do this? Well, we're depending on the next generation next year to come in and create more money. Okay, so next year, people come in, uh, they take out mortgages. Um, I do business with those people, and that's how I get the print my principal plus my interest to pay back the total of $300,000. So, so this is how the system was designed to work. There's never enough money in the system at, at any given moment to pay off all the debt. And that's the reason why money has value. Now, now by the way, um, a lot of times people say, well, how about if we had a gold-based system? Okay, it, it wouldn't change. The only thing that changes is that you have to own a gold mine, all right? Because if you don't old, own a gold mine, you can't create money. So a gold-based system favors the people that have gold mines, okay? So, uh, you know, that's why it's really not a good idea. And I've covered this in, in, uh, in, in a prior video. Uh, in our current system, you know, anybody can create money because we can use whatever assets we have to create that money. Okay? Now, the difference here is that we have to put up real assets. The U.S. government, when they create money, they don't put up real assets. They have this, I, this concept of debt, okay? Uh, so essentially, they are owing themselves money, okay? So there's a limit to how much money I can create because I got to put up a real asset. There's no limit to how much money the government can create. Um, the only thing that kind of limits them is this is this concept of a debt ceiling, which they vote to raise every year, okay? So it's, it's really not a real limitation. Um, and if we had, let's say, a gold-based system, that wouldn't change, okay? Uh, Back when we were supposedly on the gold-based system, we never really were. But when we were, uh, it was only 40 a 40% ratio, okay? And they could have just as easily changed that to 35 or 20. Uh, or they could raise the price, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the value of the gold. Because what they did is they bought everybody, they forced everybody to sell the, go the U.S. government, whatever gold they had at a certain price, I think it was something like, like $20 or $21, but then a year later, they said, oh, we're revaluing the value of this gold to whatever it was, like $26. So that allowed the U.S. government to now print, print up more money. So the point is that the government has cheated the system in the past. They cheat the system now, and they will cheat any other alternative system. Okay, So, so, so it's, not a pro it's not a question of what system is being used. The problem is that the government is willing to cheat any system. Okay, So... Now you guys understand how money is created. You understand what the government's role in this is, right? 
that 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 there's no limit to how much money the government can print up okay and that's how they got to the point where they have uh 46 percent all right because 35 trillion is 46 percent of 75 trillion that's how they got to the point where the u.s government holds 46 percent of all the dollar debt in the entire world okay so uh looking at the system here Let's forget about the $35 trillion that the federal government owes because they're never going to pay it back. They have no intention of paying it back. You know, they owe that debt basically to themselves. So that, that doesn't matter, okay? Let's look at the, at the rest of the, this $75 trillion. So the difference here is $40 trillion. So there's the rest of the world, you know, bes you know besides the U.S. government, the rest of the world... Um, has $40 trillion in U.S. dollar debt, right? And that includes U.S. citizens and U.S. corporations. A total of $40 trillion, and there's a total of $25 trillion in cash available to pay the $40 trillion in other debt, okay, in non-government debt. So basically, uh, everybody's going to default if the U.S. government doesn't print more money. So the United States government has to print more money, okay, and put that into circulation so that the rest of the world won't default on this forty trillion dollars debt, you know, as it's as it's coming due. Now, this the U.S. government is completely happy and satisfied with this situation because the rest of the world is now depending on the U.S. government to create more money. Because in this Ponzi scheme, right, going back to the analogy I said before, if I take out a mortgage, I'm depending on people of equal size to me to come in next year and create more money so I can pay back my debt. Well, this works across the board. Uh, because the U.S. government is 46% of the total debt, the rest of the world is depending on somebody the size of the U.S. government to come into, it, into the system and create more money. There is nobody else, so the only person that can create more money to keep this Ponzi scheme, go Ponzi scheme going is the U.S. government itself. So the U.S. government has created a situation where the world is depending on it to create more money. And this gives the U.S. government lots of power because now they're in a situation to say, hey, we like this industry. We don't like that industry. Uh, we like this country. We don't like that country. So we're going to make, we're going to create more money for you guys and we're going to lend more money to you guys, but we're not doing it for you, 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 and you. Uh, so the U.S. government is now in a position to determine um, you know, who survives and who goes out of business, okay? So the U.S. government loves this system. The thing that, they're not, that they weren't expecting, that they weren't prepared for, is that there would be some competition, okay? So the rest of the world, right, has become aware of what the U.S. government is doing, and they're like, we don't want to play your game anymore, okay? So you have, uh, you have I think, something of between 40 and 50 countries around the world uniting into this BRICS alliance, right? And they're saying that they're going to do business amongst themselves uh, in their local currencies. They're no longer going to use US dollars to do business, okay? And Saudi Arabia recently said that they're, they're no longer going to force the rest of the world to buy oil from them in US dollars, because that was the standard that they had been using for the last, whatever, 50 to 75 years. So United States is now in a, in, a, in a predicament, right, where they've got all this outstanding, you know, there's all this debt out there, and the world is kind of depending on it, on the U.S. government to create more money, but maybe the worst of the world doesn't care, and maybe they just default, and because they're the same way that the U.S. government can default on its national debt, and nobody can do anything about it. If the rest of the world decides to default, you know, the rest of the world outside of the United States decides to default, what can the U.S. government do about it? Okay, if they're if 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 the, if the rest of the world is not is no longer playing by these rules. Okay, now one of the options that the U.S. government had in the past is they could use sanctions and put pressure. And this situation in this war in Ukraine has completely collapsed that system because the uh, United States threw their best sanctions at Russia, and it did nothing for them. In fact, it made them stronger. It made their economy stronger. They found another way to do business, okay? So the rest of the world is looking at this situation in Ukraine, 
with with the sanction on, sanctions on Russia. And they're saying, hey, maybe we don't have to do business with the United States and we don't have to do business in U.S. dollars. So this now has created an extremely uncertain, unpredictable type of situation because, you know, which countries are going to continue to use, uh, are going to continue to run on U.S. dollars, which countries are going to enforce the dollar debt, uh, you know, which countries might try to convert it and convert that dollar debt into another currency. We don't know. This is now a great unknown. The only thing that the U.S. government can do at this point uh, is control the, the, the dollar debt inside of the United States. Um, and there's more U.S. dollars outside the United States than inside the United States. So what that means is that the U.S. government has lost a lot of power by by other countries around the world uniting to do business in other currencies, okay? And it's not just a economic alliances, but we're, but they're also forming military alliances, okay? So in the past, the United States has proven that it is really good at beating up on small countries, okay? Well, the situation now in in uh, in between Russia and Ukraine, where they've been backing and throwing everything they have available uh, into Ukraine, and it's not making a difference. So now the rest of the world is looking at this situation, okay? Um, and they're seeing that there's alternatives, okay? Uh, the United States, the rest of the world militarily is starting to catch up because the U.S. military was heavily dependent on technology. Well, that technology now has, has spread to the rest of the world. The United States no longer has uh, a, a military technological advantage, okay? Uh, the rest of the world is starting to catch up. Um, and we're seeing that that the help that the United States has been giving to Ukraine uh, has been less has been increasingly less effective. Okay, so uh, this is all creating a very uncertain uh, situation for the U.S. government. They don't know, you know, like they don't know where things are going to land. Okay, this is a highly unpredictable uh, type of situation. Um, and uh, if we look at how the United States became a world power, well, going back pre-1950s, I mean, they were a production powerhouse, okay? Well, we no longer are a production powerhouse, right? All the production is being done outside the United States. What we have become is a money printing powerhouse. So we've been printing money and we've been using that printing mo printed money uh, to, uh, to, to, to buy goods from outside the United States. So um, a lot of times people consider is, is, is you know, what's, what's a good trade, okay? What's, do we want imports? Do we want exports? Well, an ideal situation is where I'm receiving things of value, but paying back junk, okay? So I want to receive stuff of value, but not give back anything of value, certainly not something that's valuable to me. So that's exactly what the United States has been doing. We've been importing all these goods and paying for it with printed money, right, which has very little value because it's just printed money. And the world has decided that they really want to get away from accepting our printed money. So if they're no longer going to be accepting our printed money, right, electronically printed money, okay, um, and we no longer have production in the United States, what are we left with? What do we have? Okay, well, the only thing that we have, right, because there's, there's three things that made us a world power. Production, money printing, and war, okay? So what are we left with if we no longer have production and money printing? All we have is war, okay? So from the conventional side, what we're seeing in Ukraine is that our conventional weapons, at best, they're on par with what everybody else has, okay? Because, again, the world has caught up. So the only advantage that we really have in war are our nuclear missiles, right? Our ballistic nuclear missiles. That's the only ace that the United States has left, okay? So the question now becomes, is the United States going to use that ace card? To what extent are they going to use that ace card? Um, because that's the, only, uh, that's the only thing they've got left, right? If you don't have production, you don't have money printing, you know, your, your conventional war equipment is eh, substandard at this point, right? You know, because most of our, our tanks, our airplanes, I mean, they were designed back like in the 70s to be used in to be used in the 80s and 90s. At this point, a lot of that stuff is old. Okay, um, so as far as the ballistic missiles, right? Uh, 
so here's the thing, you know, you don't, you don't need thousands of ballistic missiles, right? All you need is about 20 of them to get through, right? And that will change, you know, that will change the landscape. That will change economies. That will change, you know, lots of things, okay? So um, the way I've heard it put, okay, is the United States, you know, as far as worldwide nuclear war, Okay, the, the United States is committed to being the lone superpower. Okay, you talk, you you listen to Republicans, you listen to Democrats. Okay, they're all talking that same line. They're all absolutely committed to being the lone for the United States being the lone superpower at all costs. Okay, and that includes worldwide nuclear war, where everyone around the world is reduced to twenty percent. So. Uh, this military elite politicians, you know, you know, uh, you know these, these military people, military corporations, okay, they're okay with the United States being reduced to 20% as long as the rest of the world, okay, is also reduced to 20%. And the United States is the lone superpower of whatever is left, okay? So that's the situation that I'm seeing here, okay? And... Uh, I don't even think it makes it matters so much at this point uh, who's who the president is, right? Uh, because this country is the way it's this country is at this point is being run by bureaucracies, right? By the military industrial complex. Um, so what we saw, let's say, when uh, Trump was president in uh, back between 2016 and two, two, uh, 2016 and 2020. Okay, he really couldn't get anything done, right? Because they were just tying him up in the courts. They were tying him up uh, in in the, you know tying him up in uh, you know within the bureau bureaucratic circles. Okay, so even if Trump, let's say, gets elected president, okay, and he decides that hey, he doesn't want to have World War Three. Okay, uh, he's going to put a stop to the to the plans of the military uh, and the industrial military complex. He doesn't want World War III. But all they got to do is wait him out for years, okay? Because the next person that gets in, you know, maybe he'll be, you know, maybe he'll be Lindsey Graham, right? A Republican that, you know, I think he would be all, all great for World War III, you know? Uh, and there's many other Republicans like him. So, so it doesn't matter whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. It's a question of, you know, this is where the cards are right now, okay? This is, this is what the picture is. Um, you've got you know, the, the, the U.S. The, the U.S. dollar, okay, is the most powerful weapon of the United States, and right now it is at risk. Okay, and the United States will do everything and anything to protect its most powerful weapon, the U.S. dollar, so that it can maintain its position uh, as the lone superpower of the world. Okay, and if the if the if the U.S. dollar as a weapon doesn't work. They're going to go to their next most powerful weapon, which is the nuclear uh, the nuclear weapons. Okay, so let me know what you guys think. If you got a different opinion, if you see things differently, please let me know. Please prove me wrong. Okay, I would love to be wrong on something like this, but this is how I see the current situation. So, uh, drop some comments, and I'll talk to you all soon.